one of those days when it seems like every tree here can bloom. And every tree seems to have a different flower here. So I send you some blossoms. So to start, I wanted to do a little grounding. And if your body likes the idea of standing, please stand. If not, get in the chrysanthemum position, which is whatever position your body would like. So seated, lying down. But if you'd like to stand, I was kind of called to start out with feeling our feet. Our teacher told us that all of us were given the feet of the Buddha. So if you're in a chair, tune into your feet. If you're lying down, do what you can to just connect with your feet. As you breathe in, you can kind of rock back and forth a little bit just to find your own plumb line. And the soles of the feet, the toes of the feet, soft knees, soft belly. Let's just begin with a hand on the heart and a hand on the belly. And as we said, it's a tender week. We're grieving for so many people in America with gun violence. We're in touch with the waves of birth and death with our, our teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. And just tune in to your own body on this precious day with a green comment. How cool is that? And aware of the, let's do a little Qigong. Let's bring in really soft circles and bring in earth energy. Find your rhythm with this, but make it slow. Touching the sky, big in circles, soft knees, and then just scooping up this earth energy. And it's not just a trickle. It can be as wide as your hips, as wide as your shoulders. So our fingers that when we're towards the earth can touch that moist earth. And our hands can touch the sky with a green comet. Okay, and we're gonna pause just a second and notice what you notice. I've arrived, I'm home. Then we're going to reverse that and just bring in energy from the green comet and spirit. All sides of our body. Feeling your breath. And the energy just isn't running in the front, it's the back side too. This energy is lighter and sparklier and kind of white. Sometimes gold, but. Here we are in the middle. Very good. Again, hand on the heart, hand on the belly again. Aware of the front and back side of our body. You can tip on your heels a little to tune in. And the depth, the sides. And feel our connection. Imagine that we're in a circle. With rocks and trees and animals and each other. And we have our whole body right here.
where that we're on sacred ground right where we are Each breath just settling down. I've arrived, I am home. And you can stay sanded or you can seat, get seated, keeping your eyes soft or closed. Noticing once again your connection with earth and sky. And I'd like to invite you to imagine you're in a beautiful place in nature, a place that is safe and protected, safe of beauty, place of beauty. And feel your feet on the earth there in that space. Some of us can see things, some of us just know things, some of us hear things. Tune in. Aware of the sensations of being in a safe place. Perhaps noticing your breath or your temperature. your heartbeat. And aware that there's safety all around you, to your left, to your right, above you, below you, behind you. And as Ty would say, Mother Earth, here I am. And tuning in again to your safe place in nature, I'd like you to invite a circle of benefactors that surround you. Certainly, Thich Nhat Hanh, is in my circle. But in this moment, invite from your heart a circle of benefactors. Benefactors can be people, teachers, they can be pets. Whether you can see it or just feel it, just notice the sensation of being in the center of a circle of benefactors. Let yourself be surprised. Take a moment to notice, acknowledge, your circle of benefactors.
And tune in to the sensations of being in the center of such a circle. I'm not defining this on purpose so you can explore who or what has been a spiritual benefactor for me. And notice what you notice with your body. Has anything changed with your breath? Maybe, maybe not. With your smile? Maybe, maybe not. With the temperature of your body, your skin? Maybe your circle is huge. Maybe it's tiny. Right now, I know mine has 89 participants. Good. So anchor in any sensation of goodness. Capture it with your awareness. And then take the path back from your place in nature to where you are seated. Saving and savoring anything that is good, true, or beautiful soaking in it and gently coming on back and stretching thank you peggy and kate thank you all for being here it's my pleasure to be with you again for the first time or more i'm larry ward my pronouns are he, him, and his. I live right now in Caletalao, Santiago de Caletalao, Mexico. The key location in the Mexican Revolution for independence that was won. There were 30 indigenous peoples here that have their roots here uh, in this part of the world. I want to share with you tonight uh, a follow up, a follow through of where Peggy left us, which is in the company of spiritual ancestors. In the Plum Village tradition, uh, we acknowledge our ecological ancestors, our biological ancestors, our land ancestors on whatever land we are in and our spiritual ancestors. And of course, they're all one, but uh, we identify the category so we can focus our attention on practicing with these aspects of being human. So if you are new here, don't be confused by our Buddhist language. Uh, what we're talking about is being human and being human profoundly which we deeply need at this hour of our world. The doomsday clock has just uh, moved uh, yesterday or the day before to, I think, 100 seconds to midnight. The ecological situation we are in, the wars and violence we are in is, um, it's difficult for any of us to imagine a different world. I know that's true. And even when we can imagine a different world, we get reminded every day how far away that seems from the lives we live and the societies we are in. I want to talk a little bit about what I would call 
our inner sociology. Uh, certainly part of our meditation experience uh, and learning to uh, observe our own mind and how it functions, what it grasps after, what it clings to, what it attaches itself to, what it confuses itself about, uh, which is all normal and fine. Uh, it's just how to deal with that is the point of all spiritual practice. Because whatever tradition we are in or not in, we have a mind we have to deal with 24 seven, except maybe when we're asleep. And sometimes that is difficult. The mind will not rest. So our inner sociality, if, if you are a practitioner of Buddhism, I would use the language, this is, I'm talking about your inner Sangha. Do you know you have an inner Sangha uh, or an inner council? Uh, or an inner medicine wheel, depending on what traditions you are from. Uh, people around the world practice remembering their ancestors in many, many different ways. Uh, so tonight I want to talk about uh, one of the ways I do that with Thich Nhat Hanh in particular. But, but I want to share with you the method of doing that so you can uh, choose one of your benefactors and walk through this process this evening. So be thinking about who that benefactor is right now that is most present for you, that uh, you like to spend a few moments contemplating. Uh, I have so many, I started to make a list and it was, um, I didn't have enough paper it seems, you know, I have my adoptive grandparents. Um, I have uh, my Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, my core teacher in Buddhism. I have Jesus. I have uh, Soren Kierkegaard. I have uh, the man of La Mancha. <laughs> I have our blessed dog, uh, Charlie, who passed away. I have Nina Simone and Martin Luther King. I can keep going and so could you. And that's a wonderful thing. But most of us live our lives unconscious of this community inside of ourselves. And whenever we can get connected to the community inside of ourselves in a deep way, we are energized with both compassion, clarity, and goodness. How do I recognize uh, a spiritual ancestor. It's, it's some. It's 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 a place where I can dare to ask brave questions. You know, most of us don't have many places we can go outside of ourselves where we can actually ask the questions about our life we want to ask. And this internal sociology, sociality of community is a place where we can bring our brave questions. Not that there are answers there, but in this space, uh, the question can hang in, in the blessedness of the cosmos. Uh, the practice with uh, ancestors especially the spiritual ones I'm going to talk about tonight is for me, four stages is recognizing the first is to recognize what's called the boon or the gift of that ancestor in your life, recognizing that. So many of us have gifts from our ancestors we don't recognize. And so we can't benefit from uh, the true gift that's been given to us. The second stage is to create ways to remember them. You know, in most of us, in most of our homes, we have our pictures of our mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts, our blood ancestors. Some of us have pictures and calligraphies from our spiritual ancestors or art or statues that remind us uh, when people visit us, they can't figure out what religion we are, we, we, and I, I, I'm not trying to do anything but be a good human being. That's the religion I am. 
and I will adapt and learn from anything I think that can help me do that. So as I've lived and worked around the world, I've always told people, I find something good here, which I'm looking for in your society, in your culture, in your intellect, I'm gonna to try to learn from it. And for me, that's a, a very important quality that our ancestors can keep us in touch with. The third thing is to recollect them, to not just have our hippocampus open up and memories fly through our minds uh, once we recognize them, but to recollect them, remember their teachings, remember their words, remember their humor, remember their sorrow, remember their sadness, because they speak to us in different ways at different times. Sometimes they're gentle, these voices are gentle. Sometimes they're stern. Sometimes they're humorous and learning, uh, and sometimes they're confusing and learning how to, uh, to listen um, to these voices, which are always there, is an important part of spiritual practice. I would say in many ways we have a crisis in the world today that is in our internal life. Uh, for me, we can see it tragically everywhere we look. Our, our individual and both our collective lives are, are uh, what's the right way to put this, are, are being decimated by uh, our unskillfulness with our internal life. I'm not saying anything you, you know, Carl Jung said this, you know, 45 years ago. Many other people have said this. But our society is a reflection of our mind and our heart. It is a construct we created. And we so forget that. The fourth stage is to receive the transmission, receive the gift. And that gift is energy in thinking. That gift is energy in speech and language. And that gift is in behavior. So how have you been inspired? How have you been touched by this particular person you want to identify with right now as a spiritual ancestor? And you could have a different group show up tomorrow. <laughs> and you can be that lucky uh, in your precious life. So to recognize the gift from the ancestor and try to be as specific as you can. So I'll take my grandmother, Ale Tindall. She um, was from South Carolina. Her parents came through the plantation system. Um, she was a, she did not suffer fools gladly. I would say that, use that popular phrase for her. Uh, she went to church every Sunday to the Baptist church one of the largest ones in Cleveland, Ohio, on Euclid Avenue. And uh, once a month, at least, I would go with her. We started four in the morning with prayer meeting and stay all day till like three in the afternoon. And she would rapidly evaluate the preacher of the day. Sometimes we'd have guest sermons. And in five minutes, she tapped me on the shoulder and said, okay, let's go. He's a fool. <laughs> so she, she had this radar of spotting insincerity uh, or, or confusion and unclarity and willing to face it in herself and in others. And she, she transmitted that gift to me, which is sometimes not so pleasant to have, but I have it. And I'm not going to pretend I don't, because right now we need that particular gift. So any of you who have this gift of, of um, holding paradox, transcending duality, uh, whoever in your circle has contributed to that capacity in you is very, very important to stay in touch with. Um, So I have four ways to deepen your relationship. You can pick a particular ancestor, and I'm picking Thich Nhat Hanh for illustration purposes tonight, uh, but I mean every word I'm saying about Thich Nhat Hanh. And I want to start with a poem 
uh, about him as my core teacher. My teacher, my breath. Because of you, my feet are planted on higher ground. The sun still shines in my heart. Though I walk through the waves of birth and death, caused by conditions of this world, I remain fearless because my path is clear. I surrender. I lay down my burden of pain by the riverside. I wake up each day hoping the world won't break my heart, but it does again and again and break it open, I say. I'll call on you to help me not be a fallen at the flood of pain or carried away in the flows of anger, fear, pride, jealousy, or regret. May the holy ground of forgiveness catch me when I fall from the grace that is always present. Like the moonlight appearing in the darkest of night, lighting up my path, my teacher, my breath, keep me close to the heartbeat of my precious life and to my heart's call, ever widening until the pain of all beings I can recognize as my own. So I, I have four stages of journeying with a spiritual mentor, and I could be anyone who you choose to make that you know, connection with. The first one is to ask yourself, these are like four questions for those of you who like questions. Uh, the first question is, how have you been impacted by this person? And you know, this could be a journal exercise for you. It could be a visualization meditation exercise for you, but how has this person impacted your life? And I'm thinking in a positive way. What I mean is how has this person helped the goodness in you rise? And a part of that is to use uh, language from Thich Nhat Hanh, the, what, how has that person contributed to your best seed blooming? your best impulses, your best gifts and talents being coming to consciousness for you. But that also includes how this person has helped you weed the garden. <laughs> how this person may have helped you uh, take care of the garden so the beauty can grow uninhibited. So it's both of these processes that are spiritual, um, that Ty has provided uh, me and my example of impact uh, from him is I knew about his life before I went on retreat because I heard about him from Andy Young who heard about him from Martin Luther King and I knew he had been through the suffering of the war and the French and I mean all that and when he walked on the stage as a retreat the first time I was at, I had never experienced such a peaceful human being. And the impact was, it is possible to find peace without pretending you, you don't have suffering. You can learn to transcend your suffering. You can find calm and ease in the midst of suffering without being overwhelmed or destroyed by the suffering you experience. And you can take that compassion that comes out of this into the world. And so the rescuing of boat people on the high seas, the battles with pirates uh, and other kinds of characters. Uh, during the Vietnam War, Peggy and I had the honor of being in Vietnam a few times with Thich Nhat Hanh walking in the fields uh, still there with people picking up landmines. And um, if you, for me, I, I, if I listen quietly, I can still hear the pains of people in war. What has been the impact of this person on your life? And that can change over time. So we're not talking about a fixed thing. The second question uh, for me is, 
How did this person grab your attention? What did, what did this person direct your attention toward in your life that you had not been paying full attention to? Um, for me, it, for Thich Nhat Hanh, for me, it was, he directed my attention to Buddhism as a practice, as a lived experience, not as a doctrine, though I'm familiar with most of the doctrines but as a lived experience of being a human being, not a religious experience, a profoundly human experience that is available and capable of all of us. He made Buddhism transparent, is another way of saying that. That really set me on a path to deepen my study of the Buddhist tradition, which I was already doing. I'm just kind of a nerd that way. I study things. And since India in 1977, I've been studying and practicing Buddhism, what we call Buddhism, which is kind of funny if you know the history. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> he directed me toward this path, this tradition. And the path is bigger than the tradition. The traditions we have, spiritually speaking or secularly speaking, are simply vehicles that we ride on, we ride <laughs> as we go down the path. Um, the, for, the third question is, what am I in dialogue with in my life that this, I would like some dialogue about with this person? And for me, I'm in a constant dialogue with Thich Nhat Hanh about the history of Buddhism and the adaptation of it uh, to the 21st century. And um, before he passed away, many of you know him early in his life as uh, kind of the premier symbol of engaged Buddhism. Before he passed away, he was encouraging all of us to continue that but to focus more attention on applied Buddhism. And what he meant was, how do we take what we're learning about the practice and about the teachings and make it available to people in society in a non-propaganda uh, way, in a non-religious uh, way, in a deeply human way. And we had a chance to experience that most recently in a retreat we did in Oklahoma. Uh, we had live music from Joe Riley, who has created a lot of wonderful Dharma practice songs. We had uh, members from five different tribal nations uh, with us who led us in chanting and retreats and some in dance uh, at a Cherokee retreat center. Uh, that was just uh, beautiful. Uh, all kinds of humans were there and uh, all of us left with the experience of great joy. And uh, no one, especially, you know, thinks of themselves as Buddhist. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is to be your beloved self in this world. Do not de deny your heart's call. I think that's the fourth category for me is how do you commune with this person? What is your communion like? You know, in the Christian tradition, there are old songs about he walks with me, he talks with me, pardon the patriarchal frame. Uh, but also I'm happy to say that uh, St. Clair of Assisi walks with me, talks with me. Hildegard of Bingham walks and talks with me, just like the Buddha does, just like Thich Nhat Hanh, just like my grandmother, Ali Tenzel. So our spiritual world inside is deep and wide. And so many of us are really just uh, only been introduced to the surface. There's more. And that moreness is uh, what we somehow have to touch individually and together 
so we can make a world, which I know we're trying right now, make a world worthy of our beloved lives, worthy of this planet's beauty and grace and wonder, worthy of generations to come. And uh, part of that process for me is nourishing our relationships with our inner life. So this is on the dialogue side of our inner voices, our inner conversations. Um, and what's great about the practice of it is you can call anyone in. <laughs> and you might not like what they have to say, but uh, uh, my, I've been trained a little bit in the Hopi wheel, medicine wheel, and uh, there's characters on the wheel who I guarantee you will not like what they say, <laughs> but their job is to make you uncomfortable enough to change, to really start to understand the, the benefit, the boon of having an internal community of support that you can name, that you can call on, that you can visit in the here and in the now. Some of these people may be living now, some may have passed away, some may be fictional, some may be non-fictional, but it's the function they provide in nourishing your good seeds and helping you recognize the seeds that you don't want to grow. A very simple, that's not simple, gift. Um, and what, as you work through this, you will, I had the experience of realizing um, that I am also a spiritual ancestor. You are also a spiritual ancestor. You may not want to be, <laughs> but you are. We all are. This is part of how we must understand ourselves at much deeper levels than we function in today. There's a great uh, chant in, in we do in our ceremonies in Plum Village. The one who bows and the one who is bowed to are both by nature empty. And that's why the communication between them is inexpressibly perfect. When we understand, I understand that Martin Luther King is in me. I understand that Thich Nhat Hanh is in me. I understand that Royal Ward who adopted me is in me. I understand ancestors I don't even, can't even conceive of millions of years behind me are in me. And so there's no reason to live like you have a tiny life incapable of wondrous things. Just being here is a wonder. Seeing your precious faces is a wonder. Even the internet is a wonder, even though it carries some trash. So understand the gift you give to others. In Buddhism, we use the term transmission. For communication of energy you receive from this person who is a spiritual benefactor. So don't just look at things from a material point of view, but look at what energy do you experience when you're in their presence or in the memory of their presence and learn how to receive that energy as a part of your own being so that your very cells are alive with the energy of spirituality that is larger than your personality. This is crucial. Because if we only live at the level of personality, we cannot handle the world we are in. I think that's increasingly evident. And I'm sorry to say that. But we have ways from our ancestors, both that we know and we don't know, on how to practice with ourselves, how to heal ourselves, how to transform ourselves. 
and from many disciplines, from science, from medicine, from somatics, from different spirituality practices, from yoga, from Tai Chi, etc. So I know we're trying our very best. I just want you to remember how important it is not to give up. Every now and then in Plum Village, when I was lucky enough to be there, Peggy and I, for a 21 day retreat, somehow during that time, I'd be sitting in the courtyard and uh, Thich Nhat Hanh would come over to me, sit next to me and lean on my shoulder and say, don't worry too much. The only other thing he ever said to me was, would you like to be a monk? <laughs> uh, anyway, which was delightful to hear. But what are you being called into in your life right now that one of your spiritual benefactors can assist you energetically in thinking about it, in creating the language for how you want to express it, or in what behavior, what art of your life needs to be created to manifest that. The transmission you receive, the gift of energy you receive is only to be given. <laughs> and uh, it is not to be clung to, held on to, made dogmatic about, or any of that craziness. It is energy pure energy of goodness that is uh, not owned by anyone. And we're all blessed in this way. Thank you. Yeah. Peggy just said, is that it? <laughs> I said, yeah. Oh, one more, one more, one more oh, note. Sorry. Uh, one more story from Thai. Well, we were in China on a trip, three-week trip, uh, because Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai me teacher in Vietnamese. That's a whole other talk, so we're not confused by personality. But uh, we were at the Nam Wai Temple celebrating his 1500th year anniversary. And Thich Nhat Hanh was invited to give the keynote talk. And my practice in the community for 30 years has always been to, to try to disappear. <laughs> I know that's kind of funny, but uh, you know, to sit in the back of the room, to not be on in the front. I'm not the front of the room kind of person. And every single time I did that in Plum Village, Thich Nhat Hanh would call me up front. Uh, and he would make announcements about what I was going to do that I had no idea about. There was the, the funniest one of those, he got invited to make a movie based on his book, uh, Old Path, White Clouds, which is a beautiful book. If you haven't read it, it is beautiful. And, and he announced that I was in charge of the project. <laughs> To a thousand people and everybody ran up to me afterwards said, oh aren't you excited how long have you been working on this i just heard about this when you did <laughs> and so i ended up you know writing a treatment which i knew a bit about how to do for the movie and met with different people in hollywood and india who were going to produce it it didn't work out uh which i think eventually because it got a little complicated with all the players but uh it's it, it was his assumption that I was available for the Dharma. And his assumption that I was available for the community. And he was correct in that assumption. And uh, my availability has helped heal me. So that I too can recognize my suffering. But I have found it to be a profound source of compassion. Both compassion for the world we're in right now, the historical moment of chaos and pain and tragedy, uh, but the compassion that is 
cosmological, the compassion that is recognizing the fact that we are all remarkable phenomena <laughs> in the cosmos. Everything is. And once you begin, compassion can be born over and over again just when you see a bird, just when you hear a mountain stream or the wind touch your face. So his transmission to me has uh, helped me remember my true calling, uh, which is to help as many people as I can realize their compassion. Because once we are met with that realization, all kinds of things become possible that weren't possible before, including our own healing our own transformation and the healing and transformation uh, of our world. Tell what you said when, he, when you walked into in the night when you weren't sleeping. Oh, Peggy's feeding. Another story is we were in Plum Village again in another three week retreat and I couldn't sleep. And so I was up at like two in the morning walking around doing walking meditation. And I met Thich Nhat Hanh on the path of the village. He was walking outside of his hut. He came up to me and said, can't sleep, huh? <laughs> I said, no, I can't. He said, you know what I do when I can't sleep? I said, what? He says, I write a book. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he was constantly supportive, unfailingly supportive of my uh, presence in the world. Um, I have one more story that's coming up. This also from a China trip, but uh, this was early in well, maybe 25 years ago. We He asked me once, did I know about Dr. Ambedkar from India? Uh, we had just gone to uh, Buddha's birthday celebration in Hanoi, I think, for UNESCO. And uh, he, he gave the opening talk. And I didn't know it, but he set me up to do the closing talk, <laughs> which I did. But uh, my, my, my point is that he was struck by how surprised people were that I was there as a Buddhist. It was like 5,000 people, mostly from Southeast Asia and China. And afterwards, uh, we were sitting together. He said, do you know about Dr. Ambaker from India? And I said, well, yes. I spent two years in India. I had practiced at his mound. And he was, uh, besides being a, an important figure in Indian post-colonial politics, he chose to be a Buddhist practitioner. And the establishment of Buddhism was reluctant to accept him because he wasn't untouchable. And so Thich Nhat Hanh asked me, do you know what he did? And I said, I have an idea. How would you describe what he did? He said he ordained as many people as he could. So thousands of Buddhist practitioners began to rise up again in India. So he, he would ask me, how many, how many people are you taking care of? How many people are you caring for? How many people are you uh, praying for their well-being and their interest into a, a, a path that is not limited to the language of Buddhism or any other spiritual tradition because every path is just a vehicle not a permanent station which, which humans, we like to make things permanent that are not, we suffer for it. But uh, so take good care of yourselves. This is a new year. We're already, I won't go over the news for you. I'll do that in my news piece podcast that's coming up because it's very difficult, very challenging. I don't think we understand how our nervous systems are all connected to one another. We're now starting to learn about how we're, our nervous systems work inside of our own bodies. But our nervous systems also enter our. 
there's a concept called neuroceptivity, which means we can feel what other people feel. Uh, that's the emotional kind of psychic angle to it. On the academic side, it's called theory of mind. We can even read the thoughts of other people sometimes. We can tell what they're thinking. They can tell what we're thinking. We have to learn to master these skills or they will be used against us. We have to learn how to master our own mind. Master our own emotion. And that doesn't mean conquer them. That means learn how to live with them in peace and joy. And without bringing the suffering of them to spill out into the world. This is not just my calling. Uh, this is the calling of all of us at this hour, wherever we live and wherever we are. I appreciate your presence here. One more. Wait, three times he told you not to give in to despair. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, don't give in to despair was a constant mantra after he always saw news from the United States. <laughs> and, uh, so Peggy and I once even were looking at property near Plum Village to move to France. We found this gorgeous place that wasn't too expensive, beautiful, near Plum Village. And we had breakfast with Thich Nhat Hanh and Sister Chung Kong, uh, which we often did when we were there. But we told him about the property. We gave him all the information. And Thich Nhat Hanh says to us, but you need to be in the United States. The United States needs you. And then they bought the property. Sonha. It's the Sonha Monastery. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So I told him, I'm not going to tell you about it anymore. <laughs> Wonderful places, but that is great. It's a gorgeous place. Uh, just the right size for practice and duty and concerts and uh, quintets and all kinds of wonderful things have happened there. We're glad we were able to find it. And what did Ty say to you Sunday? Which Sunday? This Sunday. Oh, I had a, Peggy, that I had an, an encounter with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh this Sunday, a dialogue uh, uh, with him. And uh, I have a birthday, what's called a birthday coming up, and uh, he basically said, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> Get back to work. <laughs> and uh, that doesn't mean the Protestant work ethic. That means get back to being your focus on the path and transmitting that path in whatever form to help others heal and transform and turn your attention to how to do that in society, which is where my attention is now and where it will remain until I can't put any more attention there. So we are on the verge of something we can't imagine. Thousands of years ago, it was called the Anima Mundi, the New World Soul. Sometimes Latin has a word of description, Greek has a description of the same thing. Uh, and the New World Soul is not a self, it's not a thing. It is uh, the energy of consciousness of us coming together in ways that we haven't imagined before. It is a sense of being connected to one another across the world, across our continents, deeper and wider than any political connection. This is the key to our future. We must, you know, the language from the NGO community for many years that I worked in was uh, the civil society. Well, we have to create that. We don't know how to be a civil society. That is clear. Some of us have been lucky enough to have lives that seem to be in a civil society space. But increasingly, most of us around the world can see that that is not true. 
That is, whatever we have is not sustainable in the same way. So we must work on developing a quality of mind, quality of heart, and the Zen and the art of saving the planet, the quote from Thich Nhat Hanh at the beginning, is we must change our way of looking and seeing things. That is difficult for our busy modern brain. Now, it is very difficult to look at anything differently than the way we've been conditioned to look at it. And so working with our spiritual ancestors can help us not be caught in the trance of sameness, in the trance of conformity, in the trance of nonconformity, in whatever trance we're in so that we are not grounded in the preciousness of our lives. Because whenever I'm grounded in the preciousness of my life, I am also grounded in the preciousness of your life. Take good care.